So, hello everybody um, and welcome all of you to our webinar, Small Win for Powering of Grid Communities, Market Assessment Methodology and Cases from Peru. Um, I'm seeing some uh, people coming in. I will um, just start very uh, slowly, let's say, and uh, wait that more people is coming in. Um, but I wanted already to say hello to everybody. Let's um, wait one, two minutes uh, because um, normally people are coming a bit uh, later. Um, so I see that the numbers are still going high. And we will start definitively soon uh, in our, on our, uh, with our webinar. And yeah, let's uh, start. Uh, thanks for being with us today. Again, hello and welcome to our webinar. This webinar is a joint effort between the initiative Visions of Sustainability of the Wuppertal Institute in Germany and the Wind Empowerment Association. My name is Willington Ortiz. I am research associate at the Wuppertal Institute. And today I will have the honor of introducing to you five extremely interesting energy practitioners. And they will give us an overview about their experiences and knowledge about how to effectively deploy small wind turbines for providing sustainable access to electricity to population without access to the grid. So I would like to say very few words about the aim of the webinar so that we get a kind of uh, general framework where why we started this webinar in cooperation with uh, Wind Empowerment and Visions. As all of you uh, know, the last decade, we have seen significant progress towards the goal of achieving universal access to electricity. Decentralized renewable energy solutions have played a very important role in this achievement so far. Um, and it is now increasingly recognized by several types of actors and, and increasingly also by, uh, through by political and government actors that decentralized uh, renewable energy solutions are essential for closing the large gap we are still facing with, which is more or less a a 800 million people, according to the last um, um, to the last report from um, SE for All, as, as you probably know all. So, particularly the extraordinary developments of solutions based uh, on solar photovoltaic have gained great attention. But uh, all of you probably also know that other technologies like micro hydro and small wind have also demonstrated their uh, suitability for meeting the power needs of off-grid communities. And we in the Wishons uh, initiative have been particularly interested in supporting, in supporting innovative approaches for taking advantage of these two renewable energy um, power technologies. So that's why we have been partnering with the Wind Empowerment Association almost since its inception back in 2011. And in this context, we jointly decided to open this virtual room for conversation. Um, and the main uh, aim is to um, uh, have the possibility to, to dis present and discuss experiences and knowledge that the uh, Wind Empowerment Association and, and its members have been consolidating in the last decade. And this webinar is, let's say, the start of that conversation. So for that aim, we have today um, five excellent panelists with a lot of experience from the fields. And in order to take advantage of this opportunity of having these people here, uh, the webinar is organized, in two, is organized in two main blocks. So in the first block, we will hear our panelists. They will will share with us some key aspects about their, their knowledge and experience in promoting the application of small wind turbines. Um, and uh, this will take more or less 50 minutes. And in the second block, which uh, should take more or less 30 minutes at the end of the webinar, we will have the possibility to discuss with these uh, panelists, with these experts. And here we will like to encourage you, the, the, our audience, to be part of the discussion. How? 
by sharing with us questions or remarks that you think it will be important to focus on during the discussion. So please use the chat function that is on, on the uh, bottom um, of the uh, go to webinar uh, panel. And we will collect your questions and ideas and try to bring all of them into the discussion at the uh, in the second block of the of the webinar. So I don't want to take more time. Let's start the first block with uh, the presentation of Alfie Alson. Alfie has been, if I remember correctly, more or less four or five years already part of the of the board, executive board of William Power. But the more important thing for today is that he has been very active on developing the uh, market assessment methodology that is um, applied by um, by William Power for um, yeah for assessing the the potentials in at, at national level. So Alfie, the floor is yours. And remember, please to make on the your mic. Yeah, <laughs> very nice. <laughs> yeah, we, we thanks very much, Wellington. That was a fantastic introduction. Um, can can you see my screen? Okay. Yeah, we are seeing yes. your screen. Okay, fantastic. I'll I'll get started then. Um, well, first of all, I can see quite a few people attending the the webinar already, so that's fantastic. Thank you all for coming. Um, so. Wellington was saying, um, my name is Alfie. Uh, I have been part of Wind Empowerment for um, the better part of five years now, um, serving on the executive board as the treasurer of uh, the association. Um, uh, more relevantly to this um, discussion, I've been uh, working on the Wind Empowerment Market Assessment methodology. Um, so in this presentation, I plan to give you all uh, a brief introduction to that methodology. Um, why we're interested in doing market assessments in the first place, um, but also a very brief uh, introduction to the context of rural electrification in Peru, which I'm sure my uh, Peruvian friends will do a better job of. Um, so I'm, I'm sure many of you are already aware and familiar of uh, wind, wind power and small wind in the context of rural electrification. Um, when we talk about small wind turbines, especially in the context uh, we'll be discussing today, we are talking about machines uh, typically in the region below 10 kilowatts. So we can be talking about you know, five kilowatt devices or uh, devices that are on in the in the order of uh, 100 to 200 watts as well. Um, so Willington mentioned that uh, a lot of the gains in rural electrification the last decade or two decades has been built on um, uh, um, advances in solar technology. It's also been um, based on advances in uh, extension and so on. Um, there is a niche for wind power um, where the resource is strong um, and where community support is available to construct and maintain um, wind turbines. Uh, it can still play a part. Um, that's something that I think is is really valuable to remember. Um, so whether that's part of a standalone system um, based in a household, or whether that's part of a community mini grid, um, that can remain the case. Um, so one of the advantages and one of the uh, differentiating factors for small wind over other types of uh, off-grid generation is that small wind turbines can be locally manufactured. So that's one of the the really key aspects of small wind that wind empowerment in particular focuses on. This ability to have community engagement uh, through not only the construction, but the ongoing maintenance of wind turbines, ensure that it's not just a uh, an energy solution for a few months after uh, the solution has been deployed, um, but something that can last and uh, remain sustainable for, for the long term. Um, so, as for the context of Peru, uh, Peru has, uh, as of 2019, an electrification rate of 95.2%, which is incredible progress uh, compared to only a decade ago. Uh, but it still does leave 2 million people, mostly the rural poor, without reliable access to electricity. Um, 
Uh, Peru does, however, have um, very significant wind resources, especially high in the Andes Mountains and along coastal regions. Um, so it does represent a high potential for off -grid wind power, especially, and should be stressed, especially where wind and solar resources are complementary and there is uh, the potential to hybridize um, a small wind and solar uh, off-grid system. Uh, as with most countries, grid extension is the preferred uh, method of off-grid electrification in Peru, uh, but this is often not economically feasible, um, especially due to the, uh, the low population densities in some of the, some of the rural areas, also the, the rough terrain with the um, Andes Mountains and the Amazon region. Um, so I'm, I'm showing you two maps here. The map on the left of your screen is the wind map of Peru at 50 meters. Um, the, uh, the legend for this is on the bottom of the screen. This is taken from the Global Wind Atlas, which is an online um, application. Um, it's an incredibly useful tool uh, for doing very rapid assessments of whether wind is or is not a viable solution for a rural electrification in your area. Of course, it's very important to understand what the, uh, the resource regime is going to look like. This gives you the annual average. It doesn't give you the uh, seasonal aspects of this as well, which are important to consider. On the right of this uh, of these maps, is the um, national grid um, map of Peru. So you can see that there are still some areas, especially further away from the coast, um, that do not have uh, significant national grid coverage. I'm sure uh, my friends also on the webinar will go into more detail on this. I just wanted to uh, give you this introduction before. And so when we're talking about Peru, um, I should give you all a quick introduction to um, some historical initiatives of small wind uh, for rural electrification in Peru. Um, one of the significant um, um, uh, examples would be um, the Latin American chapter of uh, Practical Action, which is an international NGO. So between 2008 and 2010, a, uh, we were successful in installing over 35 small wind turbines uh, in and around the community of El Alumbre. Um, which was chosen um, due to uh, viable levels of uh, wind resource. Um, you can see that highlighted on the uh, other wind map on the screen now. Um, Follow-up research uh, in 2010 indicated that the initiative um, has done, has to date had a, quite a significant um, impact. So, uh, the study mentioned and referenced here showed that five hours of access per day to electricity were provided to um, households within the community, um, which led to increased activity in the evening, including increased um, levels of electrical lighting for studying, um, for weaving and knitting. Um, there were uh, four computers, I believe, um, and audiovisual equipment. Um, used in the school, thanks to the electricity that was provided. Um, and there was also a vaccine refrigerator um, that could be used within the healthcare centre, allowing for more long-term um, healthcare solutions. Um, on, on, the other, on the other hand of this, um, the, one of the difficulties faced by this, um, this uh, programme of work was uh, later, a few years after the, uh, the installations were made, um, it was found by uh, a number of researchers that the, the sites and the installations were no longer being used, um, whether that was through uh, other uh, resources and other um, electrification solutions being connected or whether that was through uh, the turbines themselves being in need of repair and, and they were not in fact repaired. Um, that varied between turbine. Um, it was an unfortunate end to what was initially a very successful pro project. Um, another example of um, small wind initiative in Peru is of course wind aid. Um, so uh, Gandhi who is on the call as well will be able to give you a much better description of wind aid but just as an introduction. 
Um, so WindAid was a social enterprise um, and volunteer organization which was founded um, over 14 years ago now. Um, it's also one of the founding organizations of Wind Empowerment as a network. Uh, in 2009, um, they started their volunteer program, uh, which specifically aims at, uh, aims at using community engagement um, and capacity development to ensure that um, wind turbine installations remain a, uh, a sustainable solution rather than something only for the short term. So that, that brings me on to uh, market assessment. I'm, I'm talking a fair bit about uh, the need for a solution to be sustainable in the long term rather than just a, a short term solution. Um, of course, uh, you know, uh, electrification solutions are needed now where, the, where there is a community that doesn't have electrification. There is a lot of drive, a lot of passion to bring electricity to these people. What needs to be uh, considered is whether the uh, the installation of wind turbines is going to be a long-term um, benefit to the community rather than just a short-term benefit, as I've been saying. So that brings us to market assessments. A market assessment is defined as a study that identifies how well a product or services service matches the needs of the consumer. And in this instance, the product is a wind, wind turbine or an wind turbine system and the service is energy provision to the people who need it and then the consumer of course is those people who need it the uh, the rural poor in our case so a good market assessment needs to consider the whole range of aspects that feed into the success or failure of a uh, an off-grid energy system um, so in the instance of uh, wind turbines we need to consider competing services for example, for a long-term um, project, if we install a wind turbine very, very close to the existing grid, um, then over the long term, it's a, it's a high chance that the grid will be connected to that community if the community is um, using electricity and has ambitions to increase their use of electricity. Which brings me on to the demand. You know. What is the aspiration of the community? What would they like to use um, energy for? Um, what would their use profile look like? Does this fit with the generation profile of wind turbines, for example? Um, and then the technical potential of uh, wind turbines. What is the available wind resource in that location specifically? Um, is there enough wind resource there um, to enable generation of energy? Uh, for the people who need it. And then uh, the last point on this list, the enabling environment, is a bit of a catch-all thing. You know, it, it, it covers all aspects and all actors. Enabling environment could cover policy and regulation at the very highest level, or it could be um, it's just a, a case of, you know, is there uh, the technical capacity to repair a wind turbine in the community that the wind turbines are being installed in? Um, so all of these all of these aspects would be considered in a more or less formal way anyway. But the market assessment wants to, it aims to make sure that these are considered in um, a rigorous way and formulated into a framework that can then assess uh, which locations are most feasible um, or which solutions are most feasible for a location. Uh, so wind empowerment with the market assessment um, methodology has conducted a number of assessments. Um, so before my time in wind empowerment, um, there were a number of researchers um, conducting and developing this methodology and conducted um, such studies in Nicaragua, uh, Ethiopia, Malawi, and uh, most recently myself and uh, Kimon um, conducted one of these assessments in Nepal and Kimon will be talking to you about the Nepal assessment in the next presentation. Um, I've included some links to these assessments in the presentation which I believe will be shared after the webinar. Um, thank you very much for listening. So I will hand back over to Wellington I believe. Yep thank you very much um, Alfie and yes we will share we already have the agreement of all uh, our panelists and we will share with you via our our um, 
our online, uh, online page, uh, web page, the, the whole uh, documentation of this webinar. And as mentioned by um, Alfie, we will uh, jump into this more introduction uh, about what is a market assessment and why to uh, to see a, a bit more in detail how this work um, and how this was was um, structured for analyzing the uh, market um, potentials in Nepal and for that we have Kimon uh, Kival Kilval um, who is um, uh, it's a very long, has a long, very long experience working not only in, in wind but in in other uh, renewable energy technologies in Nepal, and is also part of the Wind Empowerment Executive Board. Kimon, the, the floor is yours. Hello. And um, yeah. Oh, can you hear me, Willington? Yes, we can hear you now. Oh, awesome. Okay. So, can you see my screen as well? Yes, and probably okay. In few what about seconds. now? So the full, yeah, we are ready. Okay, so the floor is yours. Okay. Try to with to to be con, uh, consistent with the time, um, okay. so that we can have the the discussion afterwards. Yep. All right. So thank you so much, Willington, for your kind introduction. Uh, just just um briefly introducing myself. I've been working with uh, Win Empowerment for the past one and a half years. And, and I've been working, um, well, I've spent more than nine years working with small uh, renewable energy systems in Nepal. And, and so today my talk is going to be about the market assessment methodology, especially which we, uh, we, which we did uh, in the market assessment for Nepal. Um, so the Win Empowerment Market Assessment Methodology is developed over the years with uh, different projects and implemented in different countries. And the last one uh, was carried out in Nepal as LV has already mentioned in his, uh, in his slides before. Uh, I was not specifically involved in the previous Win Empowerment mar Market Assessment projects, but, um, but, but the most recent one, which was carried out in Nepal, uh, Alfred and myself, we contribute. We we collaborated uh, in 2018, which was also one of the projects uh, supported by Visions. Um, so, starting with um, with the market assessment, well, uh, the definition part of it, which has been very nicely um, done by Alfred, is one of uh, one of his slides. But just let me very quickly go through. Uh, go through uh, go through the term again. So just to get rid of some uh, mini uh, initial misconception, the market assessment is often misunderstood as a purely financial exercise, but it couldn't be further away from the truth. The market assessment actually is a holistic process that aims to establish the suitability of the products or services in a given context, considering technical factors, uh, social factors, economical factors, and and uh, again, the ability of alternative products to meet the same need. So the it, it is not just a financial exercise, but a tool and a process to ensure that the future projects benefits from the lessons of the past and and so that the chances of the successful implementation of these projects can be can be maximized. So basically what we are asking through market assessment is um, is uh, how can small wind turbine contribute or whether it can actually contribute or not, um, whether it can, um, what, what is needed to maximize its contribution. Um, so moving to the next slide. Um, so there are three different phases of market assessment methodology, uh, which are learning from the previous experience, uh, geospatial, well, uh, techno-economical modeling and, and mapping mapping the energy access ecosystem. So I'll be talking about each of these phases in, in, in the rest of my presentation. Just uh, before going through the methodological steps, it would be useful to briefly mention about uh, the data collection uh, process. So uh, basically both quantitative and qualitative data is sought throughout the project uh, in order to enable a numerical 
estimation of the market potential, but also to gain valuable insight into what has resulted in success and failure in the past. So um, a large amount of geospatial data used in the analysis is basically open source, uh, which can be found online. But uh, so for example, the wind resource data is uh, collected from DTU uh, Global Wind Atlas. And, and, and so the main intention being that we can, we can apply the methodology uh, to any country. Uh, another important thing is, is that the geospatial processing is, is modular. And so the updated resource data can be used again in the analysis in the later date as, as, uh, as required. Um, so um, the first step in the market assessment um, methodology is learning from the previous experience, which allows us to understand the existing barriers. Um, things that have worked in the past and actions that have failed. So this is one of the most important phase of the project as all of the data collection happens in this phase. Um, to understand these things, there are three different components which are um, in, in this phase, which are literature review, end user survey and stakeholders interview. So um, the literature review is basically reviewing the policy documents, the technical reports and the academic papers which will be very useful to gain the valuable insight, not just um, only with the electrification with small wind turbines, but, but also in uh, considering the overall electrification landscape of that country. Um, the, um, another component in phase one is the end user survey. And, and so during the end user survey, several uh, small wind turbine installation sites is visited to collect information on uh, technical, financial, and managerial aspects of the project. Um, a number of uh, beneficiary households, as well as the operation committee, are interviewed. Some of the key questions which are asked are uh, the, the components that we feel, the causes of failure, the frequency of failure, its uh, consequences, the repair and maintenance, and its, uh, and its associated cost. But uh, the other investigations also revolves around the technical capacity, the revenue, and the productive end in uses. So basically the end user survey allows us to understand the ground reality and the critical factors from the previously implemented projects. Um, the the, the um, step three of the um, phase one is uh, the stakeholder interview, which is conducted to elicit information from experts working in small wind and, and rural electrification sector. The main aim of the interview is to identify the common concerns regarding the prospects of uh, electrification with small wind. And so various topics which are discussed may be manufacturing and logistics, uh, site design, planning process, uh, supply chain, uh, quality and standards, uh, policies, etc. The audio is basically, the interview is uh, audio recorded and is transcribed later to generate key points to analyze the common theme between these interviews. So, um, so this is also a very important step because there's always a great wealth of experience, opinions, and expertise in the sector. And compiling these together uh, actually becomes very essential res resource in the final analysis and recommendation part. The, the second phase is um, the techno-economical modeling. Um, and, and, and actually, which is Alfred's uh, key area of expertise, uh, he has uh, actually carried out all the techno-economical modeling and analysis for uh, the recently carried out uh, Nepal market assessment work. So, so if you've got any technical question regarding this, please don't hesitate to ask uh, in the later session. Um, but so the techno-economical modeling is actually uh, a uh, combination of uh, mini-grid optimization software called HOMA, which I think everybody is aware of, uh, which is linked via a Python program with uh, GIS mapping software. Uh, well, GIS is, uh, actually stands for Geographical Information System, in case if anyone is not familiar with it. And so this allows the optimal system design for a given location and, and, and size, uh, sizes uh, for all areas across the country to be, to be mapped uh, in, in a specific resolution. Uh, so moving on to the next slide, which shows the schematic uh, of, the, of how the mapping process actually works. So the uh, load profile and the component cost 
um, data feeds into into the Homer, Homer software, um, and and the simulation assumes um, a specified system lifetime while accounting for capital cost, uh, operational cost, and its uh, replacement cost within this uh, specified lifetime period. The the output of the Homer simulation is 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 uh, actually uh, used as an input into the Python code, which also reads uh, different GIS resource maps. And so the cost optimal system type can be generated using using these values. So um, by the end, what we have is that we'd be able to visualize maps indicated indicating the geographical distribution of the market with with different generation mix. Um, and and so we'd be able to know the total capacity of the of the technology, for example, wind or maybe uh, wind solar hybrid systems or even with diesel systems to uh, with, with its corresponding costs for implementation. Uh, the, uh, some of the GIS input, input maps uh, are uh, the wind resource maps, the solar resource map, the topographical map. And so, um, so the two maps in this slide we have is the accessibility map of Nepal and the wind resource map. Um, the one that is particularly tricky to arrange is the electrification electrification map. So um, to determine the market size for off-grid systems, we must first define the region that uh, that we know um, have sufficient access to electricity. So the one in the slide is taken from the OpenStreetMap, which is a open source database for geospatial information. But, but the thing is that it's uh, limited. Uh, and so what, we, what, uh, what can be done is to have another map, which is a nighttime light pollution data from NASA, which could be used in tandem to highlight the probable areas for, uh, for probable electrification. Uh, and, and the final step for the uh, methodological process involves mapping the energy access ecosystem. And, and uh, so basically what we do in this stage is uh, we draw together the findings from the previous stage. The findings are triangulated and supplemented to generate a series of recommendations which are designed to, to facilitate the transition to a technological intervention also at the same time while addressing the barriers um, identified during the assessment. So for, um, well, for Nepal market assessment, what we did was at the end a stakeholders engagement workshop was carried out which is also very useful and encourages key discussion to take place based on a series of topics that have been highlighted throughout the assessment period some of which you may be able to see in the figure uh, at the site about the planning process the operating models the financing and risks the policies issues etc so uh, in overall, the compilation of different activities such as end user survey, the literature review, the stakeholder interview, the techno-economical modeling and the stakeholder engagement um, all together basically forms a very strong basis to address the barriers and, and the sustainability of the small wind or small wind solar hybrid systems and the recommendation of which can be listed actually can be done in a very categorized fashion. Um, so I'd like to just end by saying that um, creating the interface between the technology and technology, whatever that may be, uh, and human beings, especially in the development context, is a very sensitive one. And so one needs to carefully consider each element and aspect in order to achieve higher degree of success. And, and this is what actually market assessment is about. And, and the um, and the methodology achieves to seek. Um, so this is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much all for listening. And now we can move to more interesting part of the webinar. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is it has been very interesting already. I think um, for all of us to see this in this detail how you how you. Um, uh how you uh, go for for understanding this uh, in in a national fashion all these all these different components and factors which i think is is very very encouraging um we will move from from these ideas of, of assessment of market assessment 
to uh, see a bit more of, of cases uh, from Peru, as, our, as the title of our webinar says. And for that, we will start with Raul, uh, who is co-founder of Microgrids for Sustainability, and uh, they or he will uh, present us uh, some some insights from a very specific case of wind solar hybrid microgrid in Peru. I think we will learn a lot of very interesting things from from this um, um, from from really for, from the field. So Raúl, I will. Uh, so now the the floor is yours, Raúl. Okay, thank you very much. Well. Um, is it okay? Can you see my screen? Uh, do you hear me? It's all, all working very well, Raul. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I will share with you today the case of the Laguna Grande hybrid microgrid case study. I am part of White Energia, a Peruvian renewable energy company here in, in, in Peru, and I am also part of microgrids for sustainability. So, today, Uh, about the presentation, I will briefly talk about the whole experience of this microgrid implemented in, in Paracas, in the region of Ica. I will talk about the rural community, the funding for the project, um, the stakeholders involved, the development of the microgrid, and a little bit about sustainability and management of, of the microgrid itself. Well, Laguna Grande is located in the Peruvian coast. Exactly, it is in the middle of the coast of the National Reserve of Paracas in the region of, of Ica. We, I'm, I'm sorry, we will focus on a sector of the community called Muelle. And as you will see, it is settled in, on the inner part of this coastal lagoon on an area that serves as a natural protection for fishermen and their boats. Community settled in 1982 is composed of a port and a series of households of households and small shops. There are around 50 households, and the population may vary according to, to the season and production, which, which is mainly composed of shells, crabs, and, and clams. This community, this community. Did, did not have, as of 2016, didn't have energy from the grid because, well, it is in, in the middle of, a, of an intangible area. Um, and also didn't have another services. So this posed an, an opportunity for, for us as a company because Waira and Energia had already contact with this community. So we developed a project and we only need some funding and uh, well, the opportunity came because we could take advantage of, of an energy innovation contest um, by the Inter-American Development Bank. So the White Energia team presented this this uh, this proposal, and we won. We were one of the of the winner companies. We were able to develop this project. However, the project involves more than only the community and wider energia because there are more stakeholders involved. We have the community, uh, wider energia, which turned out to be the, the EPC contractor and, and which developed the, the management of, of the construction mainly. Then we have the Inter-American Development Bank, granted the funding, and Fondepes, which is uh, the regulatory institution for rural fishery ports here in Peru. On the PES, together with the corresponding ministry, granted, granted the, the Laguna Grande the access for um, and permits for um, for fishing in that part of, of the National Reserve. And then we have the Paracas National Reserve Management Team. So I will, I will not talk more about this, this um, coordination uh, from um, between these five stakeholders, but I will say that it was quite long. Nevertheless, it was um, successful because we managed to, to construct the microgrid. So in, when it comes to the development of the microgrid, 
we can see you can see in the map um, that the global wind atlas and Laguna Grande is located in a very convenient area for wind energy as well as for for solar energy so in Laguna Grande there are a total of 50 households but only 32 registered for for this service because once once the the project uh, and the funding was granted we had to register the households who wanted to participate in in the project because because a tariff would be charged to them in order to to have some funds to for reinvestment we will see that um, later then the next step was the wind and solar assessment the design of the of the microgrid then we passed to the construction within the authorized area of the port because we are still in an intangible area so we have to to develop the microgrid in in the in an out in an area authorized for that the next step was the commissioning of the system and the training for the operation and maintenance and finally well this microgrid is this microgrid was uh, was developed in 2016 and up to now we we have um developed some analysis and research and it has been quite quite successful so now i want to present you a simplified diagram of of this microgrid so i have divided it in in six sections section number one is the um, presents the two wind turbines uh, of three kilowatts each that are used in this in this microgrid each of them is um, connected to a wind controller and their respective dump load then we have a pv array well two pv arrays of of three kilowatts each they have an open circuit voltage of 109 volts and they are connected each one to their um to their respective inverter charger um, and which each have an integrated mppt controller for for the solar pv array next well i have already mentioned the, the, the inverters and we have a, in section number four in the image the the battery bank which is at 48 volts and 800 amp hours these components that that i have mentioned so far are connected to a 48 volt dc bus and then we have finally the 230 ac um part of the of the microgrid which which gives energy to all the registered households each household has a an energy meter that allows that allows the the management team of of the of of the community to to charge to well to register the consumption and then charge them by the end of the month here we have some pictures of of the pv array uh, it is not tilted in, in that photo. Then there, are, it's a little blurry, I'm sorry, but uh, there are the two wind turbines of three kilowatts each. And then you can see, you can see uh, a picture of, of the community itself. There are some other pictures of the inverters, the wind controllers, the batteries, and, and the dump loads. Then you can see also how the, the whole monitoring system is, is implemented for future research. So when we talk about sustainability and management of, of the microgrid, we can talk about some points. First, well, the assets are still owned by, by the EPC contractor, in this case, Guaira, Guaira Energia. However, the whole, the whole uh, microgrid is 100% community managed and they have uh, they proposed a tariff of 0.7 soles soles is our, our national currency soles per kilowatt hour which is more or less 0.2 dollars per kilowatt hour and the earnings of of that tariff are sent to a communal bank account for microgrid expenses such as uh, reinvestment and maintenance so this has this has allowed the the microgrid to to work consistently from 2016 up up to now and we we as 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 a team the the 
the engineering team from White Energy still still go to to Laguna Grande in order to to check how is the system and also um, to collect our data for for our monitoring station. So I think this this would be all. I I have tried to to tell you this whole experience under 10 minutes. So I will be glad to answer every question the audience may have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Raul. That was very, very interesting, I guess, for, for all of us uh, to, see, uh, to see how this is working uh, on the field and the very specific case of a, of a microgrid, which is combining solar and wind, which uh, is, is kind of a uh, very powerful combination when, when these both uh, potentials um, can uh, um, can be complemented. Um, we will stay in Peru, um, but before presenting the next uh, uh, panelist, I would like to encourage you to participate. We have already we are already collecting very interesting questions. I already have uh, tr tried to 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 collect and, and, and cluster them because our, our, uh, are pointing in different um, uh, directions. So please. Uh, don't hesitate to to bring uh, your queries, and we will try to bring them into the discussion afterwards. And um, just a rem reminding for the for the next panelist, uh, it will be it will it will be nice if we can go for this um, for this discussion and and try to bring all these questions into the discussion. So try to to be tight with your with your time. Um, the next, uh, we will have Jose Armando, which is also part of the microgrids for sustainability, and he will present us something which is a still a study, but it's a very interesting study because it's taking uh, the perspective of a whole region in in, uh, in Peru. So, Jose, the floor is yours. You are already coming. Yeah. We already seen your um, your presentation. Yeah. Yep. Good, mor good morning here in Peru. Uh, uh, I I hope that you are you are all up health and and healthy. Anyway, uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, microgrids, about uh, energy access in Peru. Well, first I want to introduce you about microgrids for sustainability. We're an organization that looking seeks to provide energy assets using renewable energy microgrids that are system that use renewable energy sources but provide uh, uh, quality energy with the possibility of, to do to make uh, economic progress in, in this community. Uh, well I am part a co-founder of microgrid for, for sustainability. We are new in this now but uh, I also am part of the unit major group for children and youth, uh, part of the United Nations. Specifically, uh, in the SDG seven, the the energy assets, uh, then the quality energy of quality uh, goal, development goal, and uh, today I'm going to talk to you about um, excuse me about energy assets in Peru. Well, uh, Peru it's a country, uh, a developing country, so has a lot of problems with energy assets, and still have problems. Uh, especially in rural and remote areas and to understand the research the the study that uh, we made together with Raul in, in, into microgrid for sustainability first to i want to present you a little about the energy situation in peru uh, there is around 50 percent of electricity generation using fossil fuels the common electrification is the conventional grid extension and there are a lot of people without access to electricity still, but the, the main areas without access to electricity are uh, the Andes and the Amazonian region. And here in this region, uh, in other regions too, there are about 1.5 million people uh, with, uh, still without access to electricity in the country now. Um, but uh, in recent years, the country has improved its electrification rate in an excellent way, you have uh, about 96% of people with uh, access to electricity. 
But if we focus uh, on the rural side, the rate is just 86%, which means that there are around 1.5 billion, uh, as I told you, uh, without access to electricity in the entire country. And that's a great problem. But um, we have to we have to consider that even people with access to electricity, with, with access to energy, uh, is not a quality energy uh, as we will see in the next slides. Well, but uh, today uh, we will focus in, in, in a specific region of the country, uh, especially in the Amazonian region. But first, uh, I want to show you the National Interconnected System of Peru. This uh, is the, the image that Alfie uh, showed you one minute ago. And the National Interconnected System of Peru uh, it uh, distributes and transmits electricity to homes and other loads. And this system allows energy to be distributed from a remote generation location and to give reliability to the system because all the companies are interconnected. But in Peru, uh, the interconnected system has the peculiarity that it, it is only found in the, in, on the country coast and in, in one part of the Andes. But Peru has three main regions. One is the coast of Peru, uh, that we can see here in the in the left, there is the the Andes, uh, and there is a, a the, this Andes region is the famous for for the Andes mountains, and then there is the Amazon uh, where the Amazon forest begins, and our interconnected system, our national interconnected system, only has presence on the coast and in the Andes of the, of the country, but not in the Amazonia. So there is here there is a the Amazonian problem. Uh, uh, as you can see, in contrast to the coast, the Amazon has no transmission lines. So how do people living in the Amazon access to energy? Uh, well, there is uh, a lot of ways to, to obtain electricity, but either they produce with small terminal plants or they don't have electricity, except in some cases that have, have a small photovoltaic system. Well, but in general, uh, in this situation, with our interconnection to the grid, there are around 3 million people who are not interconnected to the national system. And the best case to represent this is the case of Iquitos. Iquitos is the capital of Loreto. Loreto is the largest department of Peru. It's this department uh, that is in the, in the rectangle. And Iquitos uh, is not interconnected with the national system. This blue line that we we see here, it's a projection line for uh, tension of the electrical grid, but it gives us, uh, it's not inter interconnected with the system and the city supplies energy through, through thermal energy, through a thermal plant, and it has a medium voltage network, a medium voltage grid to distribute energy. Uh, in which is why Iquitos is one, uh, we could call it a microgrid, maybe it's not a microgrid because it, it works as a grid system, but not a microgrid because there is no any renewable energy source. Uh, Iquitos, there are around 500,000 people connected to this system, to this off-grid system of Iquitos, and we have a demand of around one, uh, 550 megawatts with 130 kilometers of medium voltage, line, voltage lines. And this made uh, Iquitos one of the largest of resistance uh, in the world. So we have a great problem here because all energy produced in Iquitos is from fossil fuels and there is no interconnection. So there is a lot of barriers for rural electrification in the Amazon of Peru, in, in cities as Iquitos. Uh, between this, uh, along these barriers are low unit consumption, low purchasing power, uh, scattered population. The, the population is scattered in all the region, it's not uh, a group in, in one point. And this is a barrier to electrify with conventional electrification rate. So the solutions that uh, the government and other institutions do made to electrify this rural community, this Peruvian Amazonia, it's used uh, either main three things. The first is small PV home systems, photovoltaic kits to to give you know, light, to give the possibility to charge a cell phone, a laptop. Uh, the second is using thermal plants. This is for bigger cities like Iquitos, for example. And this is really used for the government of Peru, uh, in, even implemented 
uh, even the, the last year, no, no, the last year in 2017, the government implemented an 80 megawatt thermal plant and invest 100 million dollars uh, for this uh, because the, the demand are high in, in Iquitos and it's not possible to, to produce more, more energy in, in the current thermal plants. And the last one, uh, it's the electrical grid extension. So the current solution for the, by the government of Peru to, to solve this problem of Iquitos and of the Amazonian of Peru is to implement a 220 kilovolt transmission line, a transmission line to connect the Iquitos with the national interconnected system. This is uh, this has a lot of problems, yes, and even currently suspended due to environmental and social problems. Okay, there are, mm, there are a lot of problems with the communities, with indigenous communities, with uh, clim uh, there are climate protests because. Uh, you know, this will, uh, through 600 kilometers of old rural forest, of virgin forest, and uh, it's a lot of high impact to the, to the, to the environment. And even it's not only the, the environmental impact, it's more than that, it's, that is not economic feasible. The government will pay it to two thousand twenty two hundred million dollars during thirty years, and that is it's not feasible. Uh, it's not economic feasible for, by the government because there is no uh, there is no a lot of uh, high demand in, in in the Amazonian region. So, how what we proposed was microgrid for sustainability organization. Well, we propose. Uh, uh, replace the conventional electrification we use using renewable energy microgrids okay instead of electrifying rural areas through grid extension that is not economically viable and, and causes an environmental impact or for example using a photovoltaic systems a small photovoltaic systems uh, the problem with a small photo photovoltaic system is that don't provide quality energy provide only uh, light provide only charge of a laptop of a cell phone but that provide uh, uh, the possibility to economic development. So we intend to implement micro risk of renewable energy, uh, that, that are system that use local renewable energy sources like photovoltaic, wind, uh, odors, and that were of isolated from the grid. But the difference of this um, with the small photovoltaic systems is that these systems storage energy, provide energy all day, and uh, provide quality energy and the most important, allowing economic development for the community. So uh, we made a study using a methodology, using the market assessment that Win Empowerment, Alfie and Kimon presented uh, some minutes ago. And we use that market assessment and that methodology, uh, a similar methodology, to make a study in of the profitability of micro for electrification of rural communities in, in the Amazon, in the Peruvian Amazonian. And we study the profitability of this information to electrify Iquitos uh, specifically, and Iquitos in all of the Loreto region. So our methodology was similar to the methodology explained by Kimon. So I, I will step this, and the, the final objective is to to find the LCOE of the of the microgrids in in the for the Amazonian region. The LCOE, the cost of electricity. So we obtain really really good results in the study. Uh, what it was a study 200, uh, 2,124 population centers, communities, uh, and the, the LCO obtained in the study, uh, the most frequent value was between 220 and $230 per megawatt hour. And how this is compared with the actual, with the current prices of electricity in the region? Well, See, we can uh, here we can see the the current prices for using thermal generation. For example, is around is between 300 and 380 dollars per megawatt hour, and the range of, of LCOE for current photovoltaic small photovoltaic photovoltaic systems uh, are since 210 to 600 even 600 dollars per megawatt hour 
but our LCOE for uh, renewable energy microgrids is around the, the most uh, frequency value is around 200 and 230. So uh, we have demonstrated that it's uh, it's Jose cheaper. Armando, sorry, sorry uh, uh, just want to take your attention that if you can go to the to the conclusion because otherwise we will don't have the possibility to get the discussion. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yes, this is the last slide uh, that I want to sh show you. Uh, this LCOE is it's it's cheaper for using renewable energy microgrid, and even uh, microgrid use has more advantages for uh, for the community. So uh, yes, that is the that is the the objective of microgrid sustainability: uh, provide electricity using renewable energy microgrids that are cheaper and the and allow for economic development for the community. So that's all for me. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jose Armando. This is uh, uh, was a very uh, very broad uh, study that you done of the whole region, and uh, very encouraging uh, uh, figures that you you found in your in your in your study. Um, let's. Uh, take the la our last uh, uh, panelist, which is uh, Gandhi Alva. He is working for uh, Wind Aid Institute, and he will bring some various, again, uh, s some uh, practical experiences from from Wind Aid, which has been working on on rural electrification uh, or the with, with small. Um, wind turbines since um, since a, I don't remember so a, a decade I, I guess so Gandhi the floor is yours. All right, uh, thank you very much. Uh, yes, welcome to our wind presentation. As they well mentioned before, um, I'm Gandhi Alva and I'm the head of the community project development, and I'm glad to be here. So, whoops, I will hide just this. All right, cool. We are seeing your presentation uh, okay. very well. All right, all right, cool. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, so first, this is the content, uh, just to show you the, the way of this presentation is going to be. Um, I just uh, mentioned three main points, which is the introduction. Uh, this is just the general terms that uh, win date. And then I will focus more about my, my area which is community project development, and finally, the next projects uh, for Wind Day. So yeah, uh, let's start with the first question of who we are. Um, so Wind Day Institute serves as an educational institution whose projects provide electricity to communities without lights through renewable energy. Therefore, our vision is to create a global community living in sustainability. So why Peru? Uh, there are three main points for why Windy has decided to work in Peru. Uh, one of these are powerful wind resource between the coastline and the islands, then the need of electricity in rural communities, and finally the opportunity to promote education of green technology and practices. Where we impact? Uh, so over the last 12 years, uh, Windy has worked with diverse communities around the country, developing projects with companies, universities, and local organizations. Uh, one of the longest relationships has been with Blaulanca, a Peruvian fishing community situated in the northern coast of Peru. By developing a network of wind turbines, this community has become one of the most remarkable relationships for the team to our constant communication, learning, and participation with the locals over seven years. So now getting more into detail about uh, the communities, uh, I will pick Playa Blanca as an example. So I will explain a very briefly uh, history between Playa Blanca and Windy. So, oh, that picture is Playa Blanca, by the way. <laughs> uh, in 2012, uh, when they visited and made first contact with a few locals in Playa Blanca. Due to the evident outstanding wind speed in the community, they embarked on a relationship together by first forming a board of directors 
in order to coordinate various activities, including workshops, training, funding, and installations, of course. Back then, Playa Blanca had around 30 families' houses, and fishing was, and still is, the main way to make a living. Electricity in the village did not exist until 2005, when first DSG generators started appearing, and only a few families could afford to acquire one. However, buying and maintaining them was expensive, to such extent that the majority of, of them were still using kerosene lights, candles, or torches. In 2014, after a few visits and meetings, Winday and the board of directors made the decision to install 1.7 wind turbines, installing the last one until the end of, the, of last year. So, just to have an idea uh, by 1.7 wind turbines, uh, the 1.7 is the diameter of the blade of the wind turbine. And this turbine generates uh, 500 watts max. So, during those five years of installations, uh, when they did a large amount of research and activities with adults and children in the communities, um, Playa Bank is just an example of, of one of the Hmong communities. Uh, one of these activities are educational workshops about renewable energy, the importance of a clean environment, training local technicians, and performing routine maintenance. So, great things to come out. Uh, so, um, Certainly, uh, Windy and locals from Palo Blanca made a great progress during these years. Uh, these progresses can be defined by three categories, and I will start with the economic savings. Just a quick example. So, back in 2005, as I mentioned before, a family that had a DC generator will typically have a 5 kilowatts generator, which they use for an average of four hours per day usually around meal times, and refill roughly every five days at the cost of $15 per refill. This resulted in a monthly cost of $75. So families can make, uh, well, in dollars, uh, $228 uh, per month. Considering this as a good month, because sometimes they can fish very effectively, and sometimes they cannot, they cannot for long periods, meaning that their incomes are highly variable. Spending, uh, oops, sorry. Uh, so spending seventy-five dollars per month uh, takes basically thirty-three percent of their incomes, and these calculations do not include the initial cost of a generator, estimate about one thousand dollars. And besides that, uh, families can, that cannot afford to have a DSC generator, they spend, uh, just giving candles examples, uh, they can spend uh, between $4 to $22. That's basically between 10 to 20% of their monthly, monthly income. So, um, so by the end of uh, 20, 20, no, sorry. Uh, so wind day 1.7 uh, turbines might not produce the same energy power from a DC generator, but they certainly help a lot in families, uh, saving families from all these kind of costs and added further benefits, such as, for example, being able to leave the lights on between six to 10 hours, thanks to the wind speed that char charges the battery, um, saving costs of transportation to buy candles or batteries, for their torches or flashlights. Um, the air contamination uh, from the ESO generators, and finally, preventing fire danger from candles or kerosene lamps. Uh, whoops, okay. Uh, so by the end of uh, last year, uh, we managed to install 27 wind turbines, develop a board of directors in charge of the economics funds, uh, suitable for everyone, and train technicians to perform any maintenance needed. 
So now I will jump to the educational impact. And so in the communities, uh, adults and children have frequently engaged with our workshops and training in order to understand the following. Uh, the importance of renewable energy, raising awareness in the fight against climate change, encouragement and environmental, environmental expertise in research and design, how our wind turbines operate, and how to maintain our wind turbines. And finally, another aspect uh, is environment and health impact. Um, this point basically encompasses the two previous impacts mentioned. Uh, pointed out the following, uh, redux, redux, reducing the consumption of this generator to a very low level, preventing the smoke from burn, uh, flood, sorry, prevent, preventing the smoke and burning from can, candles or more fires. Environmental education from workshops, talks and training, and improving life quality, of course. So finally, uh, the next projects uh, for the future here in Windy. Uh, producing death studies, that's the first one. Uh, so during the last three years, uh, Windy team has made a lot of contacts between new communities that need electricity. Among them, uh, we have the chance to make good progress with two of them, both situated in the highlands of Peru. As you can see, they are here and they are named one Nuevo California, in La Libertad, that's the region, and the other one, El Chorro, uh, in Cajamarca, that's the other region. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, no, not yet. <laughs> uh, following a very rigorous process of studying today community's economy, education, and expectations of electricity, uh, the team has decided to gather and explain to the locals the current steps of the project of electrifications and asking their permission to install a few anemometers around the school and some family houses, and in some family houses, in order to make the wind speed of the area. Uh, you might see it in the left. Uh, there is the house and there is the anemometer in that stick. That's an example. So these two kinds of the studies uh, will allow us to understand the different angles from community. One is the expectations of electricity. This show will show us that what electricity locals are willing to use primarily and will save us any misunderstanding with them on what exactly we are doing to provide, we are going to provide. The other one, uh, how capable they are to buy any energy sources um, in order to make light and how often. Uh, then their level of ed environmental education and in general as well in order to understand the types of workshops and trainings we should run with them and finally how strong the wind speed is in order to make a successfully operating system from our winter winter winds so okay incorporating new technologies uh, well, as they well mentioned before, uh, we did a lot of focus with our wind turbines, but definitely we are considering now to start our hydro system with a solar panel. So one of the main focuses of our organization next year is to start to incorporate these solar panels, making a hybrid system in our installation. And creating our impact. So um, thanks to all the lessons that, Windy, that the Windy team has learned from working with different communities in diverse areas, along with interns and volunteers from various nationalities with different backgrounds, the team has reached a full understanding of their operations during an electrification project from, being, from beginning to end especially in, in how to complete research and coordinate with locals in order to make a good and clear understanding impact. And from our depth studies, uh, Windy and locals will be able to see and understand what improvements the wind electrification project can make in their lives. And uh, those, those improvements are life quality, uh, economic situation, an educational level. 
So yeah, thank you very much for listening. I hope this was entertaining for you. And I hope I didn't speak uh, fast. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Gandhi, for, for this uh, very uh, broad, but uh, already uh, specific, uh, some specificities uh, presentation about the the work you are doing uh, in wind um, with, 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 with aid. Um, we have collected, uh, we have for uh, still uh, 15 minutes. I would really like to use this uh, for, for bringing uh, some of the questions that we have collected. Thank you very much to the audience. There, there are a lot of very interesting questions. I will try to, um, I, I tried to group that and one, I, I, there are like three, three main groups. The one uh, group of, of questions are talking about or are, are pointing at the maintenance, the, the strategies for, for maintenance. And um, all of us know that this is a very key issue for, for wind turbines. Um, for example, no one uh, tell us uh, our observation is that farmers just want electricity. There is a need for constant maintenance team. Um, it would be nice if uh, I don't know, uh, probably Elf, Alfie, or Kimon uh, have can can bring some of of the of the consolidated knowledge from from the association regarding strategies for for ensuring maintenance, which is a very key issue. Mm -hmm. um, um, very, very Charlie, please. I know you have a lot of knowledge on that. <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be very brief and then I'll hand over to Kimon um, to talk about some of his experiences. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's absolutely right to say that, um, you know, where, where possible, um, Maintenance should and could be done by uh, external support. Um, that's that's always the best uh, procedure. Often when we're talking about communities that live in rural uh, and very remote areas, that can be incredibly difficult. Um, there is the tendency to start thinking about um, technical capacity building and ensuring that the community can maintain their own um, systems, which is fantastic up to a point. Um, they, they might be able to do small amounts of preventative maintenance to ensure that the, uh, the system survives for a long time and doesn't experience any um, gradually developing fault. Um, there always needs to be that external support and provisions for that need to be made. Um, so I'll, I'll keep myself brief and stop myself there um, and hopefully pass on to Kimon if he's able to share some of his thoughts. Okay. Kimon, oh, some, some of your experience yeah. uh, with this locally, but uh, there's a kind of, uh, as far as I understand, a kind of uh, mixed or hybrid strategies of, of, as Alfie mentioned, preventive, very local with some tasks, but uh, but also having more distributed and more uh, capacities uh, that are probably not fully locally. Yeah, um, yeah, very um, you know, experience that I'd like to share is that well, uh, maintenance is uh, actually a big uh, issue um, in most of the cases, and and uh, and but it depends on uh, and on whether the community, uh, the user community, is able to uh, generate enough revenue to pay for that maintenance. So uh, so if mm -hmm. if the maintenance cost that comes um, or, or the replacement cost that comes for uh, having to replace the inverters or the batteries, which are the you know uh, uh, major maintenance, is not uh, is not covered by the revenue that that is being generated every month. Uh, then it becomes really challenging to you know uh, sustain the sustain the operation of the project, and so that part has to be addressed in the planning uh, and uh, you know during the. Uh, during the initial part of the uh, planning process, I, uh, I thank think. you very much. I think I think this is a very important issue you, that you are linking the maintenance issue with also a financial issue, which is very, very. I think this is very, very, very important. Yeah, as you as you mentioned. Yeah, and um, thank you, thank you for that for for this reminder of, of the linkages. 
Um, I would like to respond directly to Arbert Akpota, who is uh, um, asking what agencies will I have to contact for assistance in the UK. I will recommend you uh, to um, contact directly uh, the uh, Wind Empowerment um, uh, Board and probably if uh, I suppose that uh, this person, Albert, can contact you also, uh, Alfie, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'd, so be, you, I'd be, more than, be more than happy to take that conversation yeah. um, over emails if need be. Yeah. So, so for Albert and for anyone that wants to uh, uh, contact Alfie, you will find Alfie's uh, email very quickly in, in the Wind Empowerment um, uh, uh, internet site and uh, probably also in your presentation i don't i don't remember but probably we can put it in your presentation alfie before we we put it in the in online that was a very quick uh, answer on that um we have also very interesting question on on the case of nepal probably for you uh, uh kimon uh philippe is uh, uh asking is there any emergency response plan for related to the risk of seismic hazard in, in Nepal? How do you how do you go with that? Very, very shortly, if, if you are considering that. Yeah, <clears throat> well, um, um, the, um, for small technologies, the uh, standards, um, which is quite recent, uh, and, and the guidelines and standard, which is very recent, does not address these issues for these small scale systems. But, but for uh, a bigger industry like micro hydro systems, the, um, the, uh, this kind of regulatory aspect has uh, become uh, very uh, necessary uh, after the recent, uh, well, the last 2015 earthquake. So, so I would say that for small systems, it has still not yet been addressed, but uh, I think uh, is being updated now. Mm -hmm. Okay, just one quick question to Jose or probably Raul can also uh, go in that or, or even also Kimon, uh, but very surely, how do you select the discount rate for calculating the, the levelized cost of electricity? This is a very interesting point. How, how do you go with that in a short way? I know there is a lot of discussions in the academy about it, <laughs> but how, how do you make it? Yeah, yeah, it's really interesting and a good question that. Uh, well, I, I will answer and maybe Raul, if he wants, he can also uh, answer. But uh, it's really um, relative, relative to the project and relative to the, specifically to the company or to the organization who is making the project uh, and depend on the application to LTU is the cost of electricity itself. Yeah. Uh, but for example, for full photovoltaic plant utilities, the LCOE it's obtained is calculated by the company who construed yeah. this plant. But the the rate, the discount rate in this case is uh, is provided by the financial department of the company. But for example, for uh, government projects, this is provided by the Ministry of, of the Peru. For example, uh, in this case, we use four uh, percent because it's the the discount rate used uh, pro, uh, recommend by the government of mm -hmm. Peru for projects to uh, uh, to replace uh, contaminate uh, pollution technologies by renewable energies. But yes, in summary, it's not uh, depends a lot of the company, depends a lot of the situation uh, on if the application of the project. But but this is a good. I, I think this is a good general answer so it really pretty much depends from the perspective who who is uh, if, if i if i may try to generalize who is uh at the end making the decision uh, on that and and from that perspective uh, uh the financial uh um, so the, the the cost of 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 the capital is 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 different from a government and from from a company i think this this is a good um Probably a good summary, if if I may. Uh, or do you have some other ideas, Alfie or Kimon, from your perspective? Um, um, Alfie, you want to 
go for this. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. No, it's 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 very dependent on the context. It's dependent on the country. Um, so I think the approach Jose was uh, mentioning there, going by whatever is available either from the company or through the um, the governing ministry. Um, I think that's usually the best way of going forward. Um, yeah. pre in, in the in the past, um, I've used discount rates that have been informed by um, you know the average discount rates provided from um, from a renewable energy uh, project. Um, so that, that's one way of doing things. It's it's valuable if you can get hold of that information and that data. Um, it doesn't necessarily capture the uh, the fine resolution in the spe specificness of some projects. So the discount rate was rates will be different for different technologies, and that is a very very hard thing to capture accurately. Um, <laughs> I think there's lots of academic debates on this, as, as Wellington mentioned. Okay, I, I will jump to a more a couple of two technical, very specific technical questions. For example, uh, Sangamesh uh, uh, want to know how is the performance of a small wind in microgrid context? So he's related, for example, he's mentioning the voltage, the power flow, power losses. Um, is there some some issues with power with power quality because of a small power rating? I know this is also a very large, <laughs> large topic, but probably one of you can like summarize which are like the, the quality issues and how how are options to to deal with that. I don't know, uh, probably Gandhi or or, or Kimon. Um, I'm not sure I should take this question, but uh, let me give it a try. <laughs> um, so for uh, for small scale system, um, um, uh, I would say below um, uh, uh, below uh, five kilowatts, uh, the power quality may not be very um, very critical, um, uh, but um, um, for 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 uh, bigger systems, um, microgrids, uh, I, I think uh, there should definitely be uh, uh, the uh, regulatory aspects for the power quality. What, uh, from our wind empowerment uh, experience, the uh, the uh, wind turbines are generally connected to the batteries with uh, with with the uh, rectifiers, which is basically. Okay. The one that causes the uh, quality issues, but not to a degree that uh, that would interrupt the, um, you know, that would cause a lot of uh, technical issues. Okay, I would like to bring the last, which is a very also polemical <laughs> question. Uh, Noam Dotan uh, asked uh, regarding the quality of the the need for quality turbines which is very important and also the price but i will uh, focus on the quality uh, and he says this requires actually a kind of central manufacturing which is um, a kind of the other the other coin uh, or other side of the coin because uh, we already uh, heard about the, the possibility to have local manufacture manufacture uh, manufacturing uh, but still is like a kind of uh, how is this this trade off with quality uh, probably from from wind empowerment your your discussions how how you deal with that or what are like aspects that has to be taken into account uh, I, i'll give give a very quick answer um which may may or may not answer the whole the whole question um when myself and kimon were um conducting the market assessment in nepal we we were we were asking this question because if you buy a very if you buy a very expensive turbine with high quality uh, materials um you know and and protection um mechanisms and so on that, that turbine may last longer you've also got uh, more of this initial capital to raise um, and more to finance um if you build a, a lower quality turbine um then you're going to have to pay off um, the initial capital in a shorter time because it's it's less it's less money to pay off. 
um, you're also going to have to spend more money on maintenance. So one of the concepts me and Mon were discussing is this this sort of sweet spot between uh, a high capital long lived turbine and a low capital um, you know uh, maintenance heavy wind turbine. Um, and I say the que I'm not going to answer the question in full because we never we never got beyond the the idea of developing this as a concept. I think it, it's a really important question um, that would be interesting to look at look at further. I'm, I'm not sure whether Mon or any of the others here would would like to chip in on that. Yeah. Okay. I if someone has something very to add here. Otherwise, I will. Uh, I don't know. I will close probably here the the webinar because we are already one minute um, uh, after the, the the planning. Thank you to all of you and also to our our audience. But before the audience go away, we will uh, bring a very short evaluation. I we will really like to know your very quick feedback about the webinar so that we can also uh, have your your. Um, inputs and, and we can um, always offer something that is interesting for you. So Fabio, uh, please help us to, to bring this um, uh, evaluation. And this will be the close of uh, the closing of the of the webinar. Thanks to all of you, to our um, panelists. It was a, a, it's, it's a topic that is very difficult to 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 bring into one and a half hour, but I I have the impression that we got a very um, useful and valuable uh, um, discussions and, and, and insights. Thank you to all of you and thank you to our audience. We will let this uh, the the webinar open just for 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 the evaluation, but um, yeah, we will let it so a couple, so two minutes or so but um, you are free, let's say. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Willington. Moderation. Thank you, yes, Willington. Thank you very much. Thank you a lot, everyone. Yeah, let's keep in touch, guys. Everyone. Thank you. Thanks to everybody for their uh, participation as well.